we've got this guy in the background up to whatever he's up to. And then this brings us back to the question of all of these young musicians were supposedly anti-war activists. They're partying. They're having a good time. They're supposedly kind of the voice of a generation. Um, this is against the background of the Vietnam War, which is a horrible war. And um, so supposedly they're speaking out for the youth of America. And one would think that if they were saying all of these anti-war, making all these anti-war statements, you would think that that would um, not be taken lightly by the establishment. And the point that you make is that, listen, all of these people were taking a ton of drugs. Um, They were not hiding that fact. Um, If they would ever get arrested, they were not apprehended for very long. And then the even more astonishing thing is that it seemed like none of these people would ever get drafted either, and they were the primary age. So you've got so many weird things all happening simultaneously that don't seem to make a lot of sense, dark overtones, people breaking the law, having a party, and yet getting away with it. Yeah, that's yeah, the, you know, that's another problem with the whole notion that these people were sort of the counterculture rebels is uh, if they were such a thorn in the side to the powers that be, why were they allowed to continue doing what they were doing when the state obviously had tools at its disposal to, you know, uh, make life very miserable for them? And 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 they didn't even have to use like heavy handed tactics to do so because there was a war raging and there was a draft which is the whole reason for this scene to begin with purportedly yeah. Yeah. and and yet almost all of these guys who were you know populating these bands were draft age males and yet i could not find a single instance of anyone in this entire scene whose career was interrupted by the war. I mean, even not even someone like the, like someone that nobody's even heard of, you know, like the drummer for the turtles who I couldn't even begin to tell you who it was, but I mean, even, you know, even somebody like that, uh, not one single case could I find where one of these people had not been and they received draft notices, but they were always able to, to get out of it, you know, in Mm -hmm. one way or another. And, um, and then, you know, yeah, there's the question of why the police turned a blind eye to them. You know, these people were flagrant. And what you, you know, whatever you think about the laws, you know, is irrelevant. The the, the fact of the matter is that there were very pretty harsh drug laws, you know, in yes. those days still are. And these people were openly not only using and promoting the use of, but in some cases, like wholesale trafficking of drugs. You know, John Phillips admitted that he was running off wholesale drug trafficking operation and got barely a slap on the wrist for it, you know? Yeah. And, and that happened over and over again where, uh, the, where, you know, the, the state could have very easily dropped the hammer on these people and instead let them walk away unscratched, you know? And so you got to wonder why, why, why were they not drafted? Why were they not arrested? Why did none of these people serve time? Why were there no consequences for their blatant flouting of the law, you know, and and I have quotes from people saying that there was virtually no police presence in Laurel Canyon at all, that the police never even came up there, you know, (laughs) like, why? There's this whole community of drug fiends, and they're in this, and you got to understand that that Laurel Canyon is a very kind of isolated place. There's really only kind of one way in and one way out. You know, they could have very easily gone in blockaded both ends of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and, and Mulholland Drive and barricaded that entire community and gone and done a sweep through there and probably arrested every damn person living there yes. know, if, they, if they had wanted to. It would have been very easy to do. And yet they didn't even send routine patrols through the area. You know, they just, they took a total hands-off, by all accounts that I found, uh, the LAPD uh, took a hands-off policy um, towards Laurel Canyon during its heyday and just let them do their thing, um, which, which is odd to say the least, you know? Yes. So, yeah. It, 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 it makes no sense. And I mean, these people, the way you describe it, I mean, it's, it's a commune from house to house. Mama Cass had kind of opened a house. All these people had houses where people just drifted in, including Charlie Manson and his folks. They're drifting yeah. in, taking some drugs, drifting out. And it's just, you know, it just seems like such a, such easy, 
bus to make, and yet they weren't being made, which brings me to my next point is when everything started to go south on a personal level for these people, they're parting really hard, bringing us back to this Vito Pelicus, who has this beautiful child with his, I guess it's his wife or his girlfriend, common law, and these people are partying, and let's talk about what happens to that child, and if it possibly has... Kenneth Anger is a filmmaker who made some very dark films and he was involved with this scene. So let's talk a little bit about that. What happened to this, this, this young boy? Yeah. The Vito, the Godot Palika story is very, very dark and ugly. Um, he, he died at the age of three. He was a, sort of this golden child, um, who, who got a lot of attention considering that he was only on this planet for three years and that his father was, you know, purportedly this completely unknown guy, uh, kid got a lot of attention. You know, he's prominently featured in, in the Mondo Hollywood film. Uh, he was featured in life magazine for some reason. Um, you know, he he was presented in, as this sort of golden hippie child that, you know, was just a beloved, uh, you know, toe headed hippie kid and, um, had some very curious connection to Kenneth Anger. He was actually, according to reports, he was Kenneth Anger's first choice to play Lucifer in his Lucifer rising film, which is um, totally creepy, which is bizarre. Yeah. I mean, what yeah. did, what did, what did Kenneth, Anger, I mean, first of all, what, what connection did he have to this kid and, and what did yeah. he see in him? That 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 made him believe that this little kid embodied Lucifer, you know. Uh, and then and then when the kid died, uh, and he had to recast the part, he ended up going with Bobby Bozelay. You, know, <laughs> you know, you go you go from Godopolikas to a Mansonite, you know, which is yeah. just uh, a, a little bizarre to say the least. But um, yeah, so so he had some kind of you know they, they were obviously connected to Kenneth Anger, who in turn was closely connected to Anton Lavey's you know yes. Church of Satan, and uh, you know there's all kinds of weird Church of Satan and and Scientology and Process Church inter intertwined lines going through this story, and um, but this kid ended up dead um, two days before Christmas, like on mm. December twenty third, I think nineteen like sixty. That's almost Three, a solstice, I which say. I think, it, yeah, that's like a yeah, winter solstice. It was like, yeah, it was on the winter solstice. Uh, this kid who had been, you know, uh, who had been handpicked to play Lucifer uh, turns up dead on the summer solstice at three, you know, just like barely three years old. And and there's so many weirdly conflicting stories of how this happened. Uh, according to various accounts, he he was playing on the roof. He was either playing on some scaffolding and fell, or he was playing on the roof of the building and, and either fell through a skylight or fell through a trap door. And then there's a couple other stories that claim that he actually survived the fall and then, w- then uh, was killed in the hospital through medical malpractice. And so there's like at least a half a dozen competing stories of how this kid died. Um, and there's various abnormalities in his death certificate, uh, like uh, the fact that the authorities were not contacted by the parents after this quote unquote accident happened. They were contacted by the parents' attorneys, you know, because when your kid falls through a skylight, you know, the first person you want to call is your attorney, right? As you, you know? do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to call the hospital or anything, no. you know, you want to call your. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's just all this weirdness surrounding the death of this kid. And a lot of it to this day is shrouded in mystery. But, uh, yeah, he died very, very much in proximity to the winter solstice after being, you know, uh, targeted as sort of the embodiment of, of Lucifer. So, you know, there's a lot of occult overtones in there. Yes. And, and and you know, to add to the creepiness factor, the... Uh, the parents went out dancing the very night, and, and this kid died at like, ah, God, I want to say like 6.30 or something in the evening. Mm-hmm. And like within an hour or two later, the parents and their retinue were out hitting the clubs dancing as if nothing happened. Uh, their only child dies two days before Christmas, Christmas morning, presumably with his wrapped presents already under the tree, and the parents go out dancing. <laughs> you know? And he's I been mean, hand- in, and he's in been what, uni- 
in what universe does that happen? I mean, how could anybody even think about do? I mean, it's just so, the whole thing is just so bizarre and so creepy. And there's just so many weird and creepy overtones to it that, uh, yeah, it, I, I, actually, I think that it takes up like two chapters of the book is just because it's just so weird. There's just so much weirdness surrounding that whole scene. And uh, it, yeah, it's just, and, and Vito Pelikas just happens to be related by through marriage to the Rockefeller family, of yep. course. You know, the guy who, who basically launched the whole hippie movement because, you know, of course, you always think of the Rockefellers as being hippies, of course. Always. So, you know. <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah, there's just so, there's just so many weird threads running through the Vito and Godot Palika story. It's just, it's just mind boggling. Um, yeah, those, those two chapters are, are possibly the weirdest in the whole book, although there's plenty of weirdness to go around. But yeah, that's, that story is just very, very dark and ugly.